put the idea of uh, trouble dolls. Well, since Jess isn't here, I'll take credit for everything. Okay. Um, we came up with it together, actually. Uh -huh. um, we were living in an illegal sublet in the East Village in New York City. It was a very bohemian living space and a building filled with artists and just kind of a creative energy. And, you know, we were living these lives and I in particular was kind of living the life of a struggling artist. Yeah. And we just decided to kind of run with the inspiration of the building and what it's like to try to make it in a city like New York that's so expensive and so difficult when uh -huh. you're living a creative dream. Yeah. With those people too loud. <laughs> Probably not. Those people I... bother you. <laughs> Um, so, so you, um, you and Jess, are you, you're best friends, just like, just like in the film then? We have a very different dynamic than the characters in the film. Oh, okay. Thankfully, because the, I mean, we wanted to make it kind of a film about opposites. Uh -huh. kind of like The Odd Couple or just an old buddy movie where there's a real difference in the characters. I think Jess and I actually are similar in many ways. Yeah. Um, but these characters have a really unhealthy relationship, and so we wanted to play out some of those imbalances that can happen in relationships that get to be too close and too intertwined and a little too codependent. So how did you manage to develop these characters? Are they like based off, uh, you know, how do you say, strange habits of friends or people you observed in the past? There's a little, it's like a patchwork of little borrowed things. Um, there was a kid when I, was little named Nicole, which is what Jess's character's name, who was like the older girl that I just thought was the most heavenly creature. And she was so creative and so beautiful and a family friend. And so we a little bit based Jess's character on one of my childhood kind of heroes. Um, my character just kind of came together. There's a little me in there. There's a little Jess in there. I mean, there's a little, uh -huh. but Olivia is, Olivia. So what, what, how were you similar to your character then? Obviously you're, you're not exactly like your character in real life, but... Well, there's a part in the movie where my character gets up on the subway in New York City and gives a speech to the people riding the train and basically just like a, an, a full open heart kind of speech to people uh -huh. commuting. And yeah. And I always want to do that. Like, I'm always wanting to get up on an airplane and just talk to everybody and be like, did you know that climate change or whatever, I mean, whatever it is that's on my mind, I'm always wanting to, like, talk to a captive audience, which I would never do. But when you create a fictional character, you can have that character do it. So that was a really fun thing, to get to kind of play out some of the more uh -huh. idiosyncratic fantasies that one might have. Also, I had a very dear cat named Pigeon who uh, had a heart attack. Uh -huh. while Jess and I were writing the script oh. and living together in this East Village apartment and so... So therefore Seagull came about. Therefore yeah. Pigeon became Seagull in the script and, and Jess was with me when I had to put my cat to sleep and so it was really intense and so we, you know, we had that as a bonding experience as friends but it became a really crucial part in the story and um, yeah, so I guess that there was a real similarity between my life and what happened with my cat. Though thankfully we did not cremate the cat ourselves. Okay, I was gonna say you didn't you didn't barbecue the cat, right? <laughs> I'm so sorry. No cats were harmed in the making of this movie. Okay, it was, terrific. For the record. Terrific. Um, now this this movie is actually a, takes place what in New York and also in California. Did you do this production the same way too? We did. Um, there's we shot for 14 days. About 10 of those days were in New York, and New York and Connecticut, and then four of those days were in Los Angeles. And we came out here in large part because Megan Mullally um, was able to be in the movie, which we were so excited about, but the only place she could shoot was in LA, which was great because that also then became like an important part of the story. And, and then we got to shoot here um, on El Matador Beach uh -huh. and in Bel Air, and, and we just had a wonderful time shooting in Los Angeles. It was, you know, for our characters, L.A. represented, like, the, the land of golden opportunity and freedom from the loud, crazy place that New York can sometimes be. Um, and, and I think in our shoot, L.A. became the, sort of the land of golden shooting opportunity. And 
we, we'd already done all of our East Coast shooting, so when we came out here, we were a well-oiled machine. And, uh -huh. and it just was so nice to be in this light. Yeah. And, and in Los Angeles, you can, you can tell why Hollywood is here when you're filming, because just the way the light is in this city is so beautiful. And um, we, yeah, we had a really great time shooting those four days. Now, you, you got Megan on board, but you also got uh, Jeffrey Tambor and Will Ford. I mean, how did you get these, get these well-known um, individuals into your film? I paid them a lot. No, we <laughs> didn't. I mean, they all, they all did this for a, a low budget. Um, and, you know, uh, Jess had worked with Megan and Nick Offerman on a, a lovely movie called Somebody Up There Likes Me. And they got to know each other through that, and so we, we wrote the part for Megan, and Jess brought the script to Megan, and Megan said, of course, which was just a dream come true. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was like speechless and screaming then for days when we found out she was gonna play the part. Um, and then Will Forte, I had the good fortune of working with on a movie called Life of Crime, directed by Dan Schechter, uh -huh. and um, Will is just such a sweetheart, and he was very open to it, and we wrote the role for him, and and then he read the script and loved it, and then acted in it, which was a real gift. And Jeffrey Tambor uh, is represented by the same agent that Jess is represented by, and Jess's agent is tenacious. She just kept giving the script to Jeffrey, uh -huh. again, and like bugging him, I think, for days and days, and he finally caved. So. Ronda Price. Uh, <laughs> thank God for tenacious agents. Now, you said this production is 14 days. That's awfully short to get a movie uh, to be completely uh, done. Right? It was fast. It was. I mean, it didn't feel fast at the time. It felt like, wow, this is a lot. Um, but from what I gather, we did a lot in a very short amount of time. I'm used to making smaller budget movies where I've made movies in six days, mm -hmm. like a movie called Uncle Ken that Joe Swanberg directed, but we made that movie like soup to nuts. Yeah. Six days of shooting. So, uh, you know, to me, 14 days sounds like a lot, but then when you realize, like, you have a whole script, it's like 110 page script, and you're cramming all those pages in. Megan Mullally complained that we made her do like 25 pages in a day, which is nothing for her. Yeah. <laughs> She's such a pro. But it was, I mean, I think we probably did about 11 pages a day. Yeah. It, it was intense. Now, this being a comedy, um, and obviously you shot in 14 days, was there any like improv that was going on? There definitely was improv, and especially when you have actors like Jess and May and, and Will and Jeffrey, there's just, I mean, they do the damnedest things, and, and you're so delighted by the things they find and the things they say. And so the, the script was a really strong structure for everything that was happening, but then there would just be little turns of phrase, or you know, in the car scene with Will Forte, like a lot of the things he says, which are hilarious about his mom, were things that he just said on the fly. Uh -huh. um, but it was probably about 90% scripted. Uh -huh. And they're just little embellishments throughout that are nice improvised moments. Did, did, did you always want to do a comedy, or you're like a comedic person yourself? I enjoy walking that fine line between comedy and drama, and I sometimes think that the funniest things are the darkest things. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I like to find comedy through drama. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm always drawn to comedy and comedians. I get particularly excited. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I get very excited when I see comedic actors doing dramatic work. Uh -huh. So that's something I I love working with actors and also seeing them be more vulnerable and go to like it sometimes deeper darker places I think that's really exciting so I hope to get to do more of that because I'm definitely drawn to that and, and very drawn to improv and studied at the Groundlings and the Upright Citizen Brigade and yeah. got to learn and be around lots of wonderful funny people that way but I like to like take those skills and apply it mm -hmm. to the dramatic yeah. whenever possible. Now, you and Jess directed yourselves in this movie. Was that difficult? It was really tough because we didn't have time to look at a monitor uh -huh. most of the time. So we sort of used each other as a monitor and we'd okay. whisper in each other's ears. And, and then we'd get feedback from people around us like, 
is that good? Can we move on? Like we'd talk to our DP, we talked to our producers, and people would just, I mean, they everybody was in it. Like everyone was just watching and because we didn't have the time or space to, to really like go watch playback. Yeah. Um, a few times that got us into trouble. Like there was the first scene on the first day that we shot, I was in a scene I was supposed to be sneaking food because our characters go on a cleanse. Yeah. That is instigated by Jess's character, Nicole. So I'm sneaking jelly beans, but little do I know I'm not even on camera. Mm -hmm. So I'm eating jelly beans for like the first <laughs> hour of the first day and just throwing them back and like really savoring these jelly beans. And then I got back and saw the footage like the next day and I'm like, Where, where's me eating the jelly beans? Oh, we didn't shoot that. Like, but I didn't know, so it was fun. I ate all those jelly beans for no reason. So that, that now, was one now of the you definitely downfalls. have to go through the cliffs. I know, I know. Wow. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the most hilarious scenes, or let me say, one of the oddest scenes was sort of the, uh, the reality TV show <laughs> skit. I mean, really, who, who came up with that? I mean, you, that, that came out in a bad dream. Right? Oh, my God, that's so funny. <laughs> my mom felt the same way when she read it in the script. She was like... Those girls are stupid, aren't they? <laughs> I actually thought it would be really fun to have like a one-woman slideshow. Uh -huh. So a couple of years ago, I'd written this like one-woman show that I never performed. So this came out of this harebrained idea um, where I wanted to create a slideshow presentation to sort of remind people how precious and short and finite their lives are. Yeah. To like consider the number of hours and minutes and you know, days in a given lifetime, and then to calculate based on when you were born, when you would die, uh -huh. which is kind of heavy stuff, but I feel like it's a theme that runs through the film, it's just the ephemeral nature of life. And, and so to actually, I mean, most of us probably haven't thought about the year we'll die. So we kind of threw a little equation in there, and like if you're born in 1980, you blah, whatever, do the math. If you're born in 1980 and you live an average life, you'll likely die in 2059. Uh -huh. Um, so just to have that sort of in mind, I don't know, maybe makes life all the more precious, just mm -hmm. knowing, okay, I've got to live these years well. Yeah. So, uh, so it, it, it's a harebrained kind of nutty audition that came from a very like authentic desire to, I don't know, think about the beauty and the shortness of life. So, so, who, so who came up with the words of that? Poetic. <laughs> well, that was Chekhov. Uh -huh. So that's from Chekhov's The Seagull. Most of it. I mean, we there's a few other bits in there. Um, well, Nicole's character. I mean, Nicole's character. Jess's character is writing stuff that we. I mean, reading stuff that we wrote, and then I'm saying all the Chekhov parts. Yeah. Okay. So that we have that sort of poetic, interspersed signal jamming. Thing happening with the, the multimedia mm -hmm. and the cat. Anyway, you got to see it. You just got to see it. It's unlike anything else. It, it was something I have never seen before, that's for certain. I, I was very inspired by a wonderful theater group called the Wooster Group uh -huh. um, in New York. And they they have these, and, and they, they make these plays that are like multi-dimensional and multimedia and you leave them just having your mind blown because there's so much going on and your brain just picks up parts of it. So we kind of wanted to create an experience something like that where there's just a lot of stimulation and we wanted to have smells and sights and, uh -huh. and just a lot going on. But it's definitely a funny scene to behold. Yeah. yeah. Well, was, uh, was it easy to work with a um, Jess throughout the entire production. She and I had a wonderful experience. We, I think we grew a lot as people and friends, and we had to learn to share it with each other. I mean, that's a hard thing, because directors are, by nature, bossy, opinionated people yeah. who are direct about what they want, in, in a best case scenario. So we had to find this common ground between being decisive, and direct and knowing what we wanted but doing that in a way that we both agreed on uh -huh. so finding that commonality was something i think that we both kind of learned to do through the process and sometimes we stepped on each other's toes and then we got better at learning how to communicate because 
I think your ego can get a little stepped on in a situation like that, but if we let that happen, then I think it would have been to the detriment of the movie. So I think we both stayed focused on the bigger picture and just learned how to cooperate. And and I, I, we're both so happy. We had the most wonderful premiere yesterday, and it's just so nice to come out on the other side of such a grueling process yeah. and be such close, deep friends. Because a lot of people have been like, are you guys even talking to each other anymore? And we're like, yeah, actually we are. It's actually really cool. And and I feel like we've learned to really resolve conflict together. So it's been a very special, lucky experience. Yeah. I couldn't have asked for a better collaborator. So what was the most difficult thing you had to do on this project? Hmm. Well, there were a lot of difficult things. I mean, post-production. Editing, post editing is really tough. I mean, it's a long process and it's a lot of decision making and you're in a dark room and all you can do is eat candy to keep yourself <laughs> motivated. And, um, candy and jelly beans. You definitely need to go on that cleansing. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying now that I'm back out in the world. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's a long haul. I mean, what was really hard for me was a scene that I did underwater. Uh -huh. And we did it in the Pacific Ocean, and it was August, but the water was still like 65 degrees, and I got a little mildly like hypothermic, and I, and our hair and makeup person had to like lie down on top of me to like warm me up. So that was a like really challenging day. And what you think you're gonna do in the water as an actor, as a performer, you it go, all goes out the window because the waves just start hitting you. Yeah. And then you start freezing and then I couldn't stay underwater. We had this wonderful underwater camera rig and, and our DP, Dan Sharnoff, was, you know, flowing with it. But it, I mean, it was just hard to kind of get everything we needed. And thankfully it, it turned out well and we managed to piece something together in, amidst the hypothermia and mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah, in, in this business, one of the things that everyone likes to talk about is female directors, or mainly the lack of, especially comedic female directors. There's not a lot of that. If anyone thinks of a female director, they think of Catherine Bigelow, but she obviously doesn't do comedy. I mean, what do, what do, what do you have to say what's going on in this business? How do, how do women break that barrier? I don't know. I hope to find out, though. I mean, this is... It seems like an exciting time for women, and we've had the good fortune of being at the Los Angeles Film Festival, which has really been celebrating women directors, and there was a wonderful panel the other day on women who call the shots, and um, Lisa Cholodenko was there, and Nicole Hall of Center, um, Deborah Granick, and several other women, and it was just so cool to see these awesome, powerful women who have made such beautiful movies with their own voices, and. I think, I think we just have to keep making movies and feel, uh, feel motivated to do it and just keep doing it. I mean, I'm seeing so many like awesome women like Megan Griffiths uh -huh. and Lynn Shelton and Hannah Fidel who are directing movies and more and more of them and each one of them seem to be growing in success. So those are women who have been kind of a little bit in my circle or my Facebook friends that I keep, <laughs> that I keep track of and, and it's just so cool to see that happening and um, I, I just hope that I get to keep working and keep making movies and telling stories and you know hopefully I'll make Jurassic Park 7 or whatever <laughs> I mean you know and I don't know I don't know how people break through that glass ceiling into the studio world um, maybe it's a matter of I don't know trust or something but hopefully you know, as women are making more and more movies, people trust that we can do it, and we're awesome. Is it, so for your for your personal career, um, is it going to be more acting, or do you want to start diverging into directing? Now you understand this is your first, this is your directorial debut. I want to do it all. Uh -huh. um, I love working on other people's projects, and it's also so incredibly engaging and satisfying to create your own and. Think uh, the playwright and actor Tracy Letts is a great example of just someone. I mean, there's so many, you know, actor, writer, directors in the world now, and, and the world seems to be embracing that um, in a nice way. So it makes me feel like I don't have to choose. Okay. But it, this is kind of a gross analogy, but I, I compare um, 
acting and directing, like, directing is like, you know, being a mother and you have to really carry the baby to term, but being an actor, it's like, just being a guy and you get to have like a great night and then get out of there. Uh -huh. So there's something really nice and light and wonderful and also grueling about acting, but it, it certainly, you know, you can, like Megan Mullally acted for three days and has this wonderful part and Jess and I spent a year, a year and a half making the movie. So it's like, acting's kind of nice. You just come in and then you leave. <laughs> great. And just out of curiosity, what, how was that reaction at the LA Film Festival for your premiere? It was so nice. It was really surprising and wonderful, and it was such a like warm, engaged, laughter-filled audience. And I don't, I couldn't have been happier. You know, it was just such a wonderful day. I think Jess and I both felt really delighted. Um, both of our boyfriends said, you know, we were prepared to tell you for the rest of your lives that it was good, even if it didn't go well. But it, they were like, thank God we don't have to do that. Because it really did go well, and we feel good about the movie. And it was nice to see it received that way. And my parents were proud. <laughs> I, I guess one of the biggest goals for every filmmaker is that at, at least everybody, everybody outside the friends and family gets to see it, right? Yes. I know, I'm excited for it to have a wider release, however, whatever form that ends up being, but just so more people can see it. Terrific. And um, so from from here on, what what are some of your future projects? I have a couple of scripts I'm writing. I want to kind of go back to New York after I leave the festival and just dive in deeply. Okay. Yeah, just, I, I, have a, I have a little romantic comedy that wants to come out, so. That's what oh, I'm romantic comedy. Oh, romantic comedy. Romantic comedy. Yeah. No, rom com. Yeah, a little rom com. Instead of a dramedy. Exactly. <laughs> Terrific. Hey, I appreciate the interview, especially uh, here on a Los Angeles rooftop where we managed to get every single sound of ambulances and airplanes I know. out of here. I hope you enjoyed the sounds. <laughs> Hopefully, you could hear what we just.